Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you did not come to save good, perfect people, for we are not that sort of folk. We praise you for coming to save sinners, for that is who we really are. Guide us, O Lord, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we are bold to pray. Amen. Conflict. Conflict. Our sermon series over the last four weeks and the next two has been apropos of life in more ways than I would ever have hoped. This past week, various kinds of conflicts roiled up from what seemed like every corner. Horrible tragedy struck in Orlando where An innocent 49 people were murdered. It seems like this violence spilled out of various types of conflict. Inner conflict developed out of fear. Political conflict developed out of a spirit of dominion. Philosophical conflict based on us, them binary that tries to separate everybody into two groups. At almost the same time, our denomination met at its annual general synod, and there, there were similar types of conflicts, similar sources, fear, dominion, us, them, binary mixed with spiritual conflict that spilled into a variety of unfortunate and sometimes harmful and definitely unreformed decisions. And then we could ignore the conflict of the election cycle. I'm going to ignore that completely, right? Uh, It feels like, even with ignoring that, that we find ourselves wrapped up in a lot of conflict. And it also feels like some of our thoughts for Christian response to conflict feels really timely and really important. So I want to kind of just step back and look at the four very quickly that we've already covered and just reflect on them for just a second. We've discussed the conflict that is inherent in our Christian faith, To follow Christ is to enter into affliction. It's part and parcel of the walk. And out of that affliction, to offer consolation, the consolation of Christ, to those who suffer. And that feels completely relevant in light of the tragedy of Orlando. To offer consolation, love, and encouragement. We also learned about the power of forgiveness to transform the conflict of interpersonal relationships which are fraught with differences and that feels so relevant to how we treat each other in the church when we disagree on issues or thoughts or interpretations or ideas to build our relationships on forgiveness and love rather than on our differences and that conflict. We then turn to our inner conflict and the lesson of self-compassion. You'll remember the clay jar analogy that Paul offers. If we can't be gracious to our own clay jar lives, letting go of perfectionism, how will we ever show compassion for our neighbor? It feels like in so many conversations that I've had with church folk, we really need to let go of this idolatry of perfection. This this idolatry of not having compassion on ourselves. So 
instead of that, um, and then finally, sorry, the last week we discovered that spiritual conflict of seeking certainty for our lives. Instead of that idol of certainty, we walk um, by faith. We're called to walk with deep questions and a seeking heart for the presence of God. I can't help but think that that would be a tremendous aid in so many conflicts that we encounter in our lives. So our response to these two outer conflicts and these two inner conflicts, the, the responses of consolation and forgiveness, self-compassion and a faith that seeks and questions, I think that they really offer powerful lessons for true transformation in the conflicts that we face. The real conflicts of everyday life, I mean, I feel like each and every one of these lessons offers God's will and desire for how we might face the life that we're faced with every day. The, the regular, normal life of conflict. So we have another lesson, though, because we're going to focus on 2 Corinthians 5 this morning. We won't look back with those four. We're going to look forward with a different one this morning. And, and this particular verses that we read this morning, that Lisa read for us, contain the, the theme verse for our whole series. To, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. And part of what we're, we're looking at is the idea that if we're in Christ, then we begin to be shaped and formed around Christ-like responses to all these areas of our lives and a new creation begins to develop in us. But more than just in us, because God is not simply interested in your personal life, God is interested in the world. And so it's more than just personal transformation or new creation, it's also a new creation that flows out of us into the world. So Paul says that God has given us a message of reconciliation, so that God might make the whole world new through us as Christ is reconciling and transforming us. So this new creation energy that God is about is about your lives personally, but your community, your families, your neighborhood, and every part of your life. And in these words we find this foundational hope and inspiration that God is transforming the world and us, but we also find the foundational conflict for our life. And in many ways, we find the very central conflict that gives word to all these other things we've been talking about. This conflict that we're going to talk about this morning and our Christian response for it sets the stage for every other conflict in our lives. And every Christian response in our lives to that conflict. So let's dive into the text and its teaching and let's see once what we're getting at. All right. At the heart of this simple statement, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. That's the statement we're looking at. At its heart is the confession that God is creator. That God is the one who creates. God forms and shapes the world according to God's will. And God is sovereign in that creation. Think about the way this sentence is constructed. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. It's not there will be. It's not that God is working at it. It's not that somehow God has to get a partner in there or something has to happen yet. No, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. God is sovereign. If we find ourselves in Christ, if we have faith, if we trust that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, God is at work creating a new reality within us. 
and through us. God creates. God recreates. God is always working, forming, shaping, and molding our lives in Christ. And I hope that sounds like good news. But where's the conflict? We celebrate this work of God and this creation of God. So where's the conflict? New creation is a God act. Reconciliation is an ongoing work of God transforming our pain, grief, and brokenness into something new and beautiful. But it's God's working. So we become dependent upon God. It's God's creating and shaping, so we must learn to live and trust the work that God is shaping us into in our lives. At its heart, the text says this, and it's crucial to understand the difference. God reconciles the world to God. God does not reconcile Himself to the world. Do you understand the difference? Because it's really important to get that key difference. God is working to transform the world. God will not get used to the idea that the world is broken. That there is no hope. That there's nothing that we can do to change how things are. God is reconciling the world to God. I had a conversation the other day with somebody and, and basically kind of said that same thing. And this person was a Christian and, and his response back to me was, oh, you're an idealist. You're an idealist. You think these things can change. And my heart broke, and I said, no. I'm a Christian. I don't think that God somehow reconciles himself to the world. Oh, well, this is the way that it is. I guess we just got to learn to live with it. That may be our sinful response to people dying, to a lack of justice, to a lack of peace or unity, to a spirit of dominion that cannot function without putting someone else down. That may be our response to fear and hatred, but that's not God's response. God does not reconcile himself to the brokenness of God, of the world, and say, well, I did it my best. God reconciles the world to God. Now, on the one hand, this is inspiring, and I hope you hear it that way. God will not get used to suffering and pain. God is in the transformation business, not the settlement business. We are not left to despair or apathy, to indifference or hopelessness. We are called to be agents of reconciliation and transformation in the world. Ambassadors of the power of Christ to make all things new. This should inspire you and encourage you. God will not leave you in your mourning and suffering. God is about changing everything. This becomes the vision of the Scriptures. Revelation ends with a new heaven and a new earth because God's reconciling power will not be denied. If we as a community, if we as a people of God leave our community unchanged 
with our presence, then we have left the reconciling and transforming power of God in Christ. Or we've never were really on it. The path of Christ is not to find the world in all of its pain and do nothing about it. The path of Christ is to enter into the pain and transform it. And if our Christian faith cannot bring transformation to pain and grief and suffering, what good is it for the world anyways? What do we have to offer? The point of this text is that we have much to offer. God is restless, the text is saying. God is restless, a moving presence that churns up imagination and life. God is a catalyst who explodes with energy and power to make the world new again. And my God, do we need that catalyst. That spark that, that forms the the reactions in our lives that begin to bubble up with hope and grace and change and new life. We need that, so I hope that when you hear, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Hear it with the word of encouragement and love and that God is reconciling the world to God's self in your personal life. Yes but also in your family and in your community and in every part of your life. Everything that you touch. Because God is a restless energy, a restless dynamic that is reconciling and transforming in power until the world is made new. That's what it means on the one hand, that God is reconciling the world to God's self. Now, on the other hand, if you tap yourself into this restless business of a grander vision for what the world is supposed to be, for who you are and what's possible for the world, if you tap your life into that restless energy, there are things in here that you're going to have to let go of. That you're going to have to sacrifice. Because it's part and parcel of the new creation game. One of those things is cynicism. We come by that naturally here in the Northeast. You got to let it go. Because it ain't a part of the restless energy of God. Cynicism, ah, everybody doesn't change. Nothing's the same. Eh, it's not always going to be this way. That ain't it. And you have to let that spirit go. Because the restless power of God makes no room for it. Selfishness. Self-centeredness ha has to be let go. Sacrifice and release. Because there's, there's no room for it in, in a restless energy that's bringing a new creation that says that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So all that stuff that's self-centered and self-possessed and self-vision, you got to let it go. I mean, here's the thing, and I want to make this very clear because sometimes we get the idea that I can come to church on Sundays and Pastor Rodney's going to give me a couple of good words and maybe he'll make me laugh, but he's not really that funny, so we'll just hope that he gives me something I can take with me and I'll apply it to my life and things will get a little bit better. As if somehow coming to church on a Sunday is, is all about the seven-step self-improvement plan of personal development in my life. 
That's how we sometimes try to treat what church is like. But the reality is, is a new creation is not a simple self-improvement plan. It's not about personal development in which, hey, I went to church this past week and I got a little bit better in this part of my life. Yay! I plan on going to church next week because I'm pretty sure Pastor Rodney's going to talk about another part of my life and maybe I'll get a fair bit better in that area. Yay! No! That is not new creation. That is self-help guru talking. We don't do that here. And I'm not necessarily speaking against that, right? There's lots of, like, how to balance your checkbook and how to get out of debt and how to organize your work life and how to be a better employee. Fabulous. Wonderful. Nothing wrong with any of that, right? It can be very helpful for your health, for your work, for your life. Great. But we ain't doing that here. That's not what church is about. Because in a lot of ways, what we recognize here is that when we engage in self-improvement and personal development, what we're doing at our core is we're saying, I kind of want to keep control of my life. And I recognize that the things aren't quite going the way that I want. I'm, I'm not making as much money as I want. I'm, I'm not as healthy as I want. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not directed in the same vision that I've always wanted for my life. So, so I'll just make some improvements here and some improvements there and some personal development here. And then what I want for my life will be what I'll have. You know, but the, the key to all of that is what I want. It's about control of my life. Me not being reconciled to God is what it's about. It's me asking God to reconcile himself to me. This is what I want in my life, God. This and this and that. Because I, I want to be in control, I don't like this new creation business. Because I can live with sanding off the, red, the rough edges, I don't like the idea of transformation, new creation, or full submission in faith. And here is the heart of all conflict, and here's the heart of this foundational conflict. God is reconciling the world to God, and we want God to reconcile Himself to us. I'm good, God, if you help me out with this little area of my life. I need some help. Can you come and help me? Please don't talk about that other stuff over here, God. I really don't want you in my business. Please don't ask me about how I'm doing my job. I don't like that. We're, doing, we're talking about my personal life now, God. My spiritual life. That has nothing to do with this. Stay out of that, God. We, we love the idea of God reconciling our soul to God. We don't have much interest in God reconciling the rest of us to God. And this becomes the conflict. The conflict that we have that's so foundational. When Paul says, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation, he's saying that God is reconciling the world to God and not the other way around. He's saying that God's love and energy and restless desire is to make us new and not just parts of us new and not just the rough edges new, but all of us new. Because God is not so much in the soul business, 
God is in the whole business. The whole business of your life. And God is reconciling every single part of it. And so everything is under the reconciling power of God. And that's where we encounter conflict, isn't it? I mean, really, isn't it? Isn't that where we get ourselves in trouble all the time? It's like God says, love your neighbor. And we say, cool, I'll love that neighbor and that neighbor, but that neighbor, God doesn't want me to love that neighbor, right? And then God pushes us even harder. He's like, love your enemies. You do about this. Okay, God, I love that enemy. And that enemy's not so mean to me, so I love that enemy. But that enemy? Whew. Forget about it. I know God doesn't want me to love that enemy. But, but what if God really means it? I mean, what if reconciling us to God, he, he really does mean that? What if the vision that he offers in Christ with the grace and the love and the truth and the mercy and the righteousness, it's offered for all of us and the new creation is about that very righteousness of God becoming our lives. Every single part of our lives. Not just the Sunday morning part, but the every morning part. I mean, that becomes, I mean, in part it's like, this is the good news of Jesus Christ, and in another part it's like, holy smokes, God and I got some issues here. And that conflict becomes the foundational reality of of so many ways in which we get out of joint with everything else in our life. So what might our response be for this conflict that we have with God. With this conflict of God saying, I will reconcile you, and we saying, God, could you reconcile yourself to this little thing? What do we do about that conflict? So it's easy for me to stand up here on a Sunday morning with nothing really invested in it and say, stop fighting God. You're going to lose. Right? That's pretty easy for me to say, but as we all recognize, it's downright difficult to impossible for you and me to actually do. Our sinful human natures are always in conflict with God. So rather than standing up here and giving you some simple, like, statement that isn't going to actually apply to your life in any way, it'll be a dead-end statement, because... You'll say, oh, amen, Pastor Rodney, and then go use it not not at all in your life. Instead of doing that, I'm going to just simply say to you, God is reconciling the world to himself. God is reconciling you to himself. And God is doing this reconciliation in you and through you and around you and sometimes even in spite of you. So I'll say, lean into that grace. Lean into that truth. Try some way to repeat it to yourself, to encourage yourself, to begin a new day with God is reconciling me to God. God is at work in me. Let yourself fall into it. Because the, the opposite of that is cynicism. The opposite of that is to let go of the hope 
that the world might change. To give in to apathy and indifference and to act like what we have to offer in the Christian faith makes no difference. And if that's where you're at, I mean, honestly, why are you here? I mean, just honestly, ask yourself, why are you here? If it makes no difference. Lean into that grace-filled statement. God is, God is reconciling the world to himself. The second response, this one has a little bit more action involved. Lean into that restless, creative energy of God. You aren't responsible for reconciling the world, okay? Take that weight off your shoulder. It's too heavy, you can't carry it, it'll cripple you. You are not responsible for reconciling the world. God is. And God is doing it. But God invites us into that work. God invites us to be a part of that work. I mean, that's why God says these crazy things like, love your neighbor as yourself. That's our ministry of reconciliation. And not just the neighbor that you like, and not just the neighbor that you agree with on 99% of things, but your neighbor. And love your enemy. Love your enemy. And pray for those who persecute you. Love each other. You'll know, the world will know you are my disciples, Jesus says, by the love that you have. Lean into that reconciling work of God that you are invited to take a part of, saying yes to that restless invitation of reconciliation and transformation, even if it's just in the smallest of ways. It's setting aside the conflict that you might have with God for just a moment to join in the new creation and when one corner of the world, whether it's in your heart or in your neighborhood or in your home or in some other part of the world, when one corner of the world is made new by this reconciling, loving, transforming energy of God, then we celebrate and rejoice, give thanks for that new creation and move to the next one. And take part in, in this wonderful presence and power